Hello everyone, welcome. Um, it's quite all right to be noisy. I want you to um, shout out to me if I ask you a question. Um, that feels quite loud, but never mind. We'll see how it goes, but hopefully you can all hear at the back. Can you hear at the back? Yeah. yeah, okay, good. Right, that's the sort of noise we're looking for. Maybe not quite as loud, but you know, we're going there. Right, now, um, so I introduced myself. Um, so I'm Professor Adrian Bell. Um, says my name there. I'm uh, a, a research dean at the University of Reading uh, for the f strange name theme, prosperity, prosperity, I can't even say it, Prosperity and Resilience. And today I'm helped by my uh, less than willing colleague, colleague over here, Tony, Dr. Tony Moore, um, who is a lecturer in finance at uh, Henley Business School, also here today. And today we're talking about, as it says on the slides, uh, money matters. What if we told you uh, everything, I've got to remember what the title was, everything you knew about money wasn't quite as it seemed. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, um, I'm just going to move on a slide. This is the most boring slide, so don't, don't expect the rest of the lecture to be as boring, I hope. Um, so, what are we saying? We're saying in the event of an emergency evacuation, which won't happen, but if it does happen, please follow signs to the emergency exits. Uh, the assembly point is outside at the front of the building. Um, and throughout the, uh, the, the lecture, this isn't health and safety, but please keep your mobile phones on silent. Okay, thank you very much. So this is the, get rid of that boring slide. Okay, so, so just going to talk a bit that um, my job at the university, as it said in, in, the, in the slide, is, is doing research. And for me, that's the best job in the world. So whatever your mummy and daddies tell you, uh, my job is the best job in the world, because all I do all day is research. I either do research or I talk about research. Um, why is that exciting? Because I'm very curious about the world. I want to know how the world works, how it can be explained, and I get the chance to do that every day and talk to our other researchers at the University of Reading about how they do their research and what they're discovering, um, because we all want to make a difference. Um, and what I've shown in this slide here is, um, is, is a slide of, of Europe. I'm going to say a slide of medieval Europe, but it's still Europe. And um, myself and Tony over there, we're both um, economic historians uh, of medieval Europe. Um, and that means we're particularly interested in money, and that's why the talk today is about money. In this period, um, trade networks expanded, and the first banks and accounting was introduced to Europe via Italy. Uh, and this slide just shows that how it worked. But I won't really go into it today, but just it shows the flows of trade and money that allowed money to become um, so important and what I'm going to tell you about today. It was a really exciting and dynamic time with plague um, or pandemic, as we know today, war and popular revolt. Does anyone think that sounds familiar to us today? Okay. Now, next slide. This is a question. Anyone knows who this person is? You can shout out. We don't have to, we don't have to throw an opinion, but I, can, can anyone shout out who this is? Qua, that's good. Well done. Yes, Quasi Kwarteng. And who was he? He was the Chancellor. He was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Former Chancellor of the Exchequer. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer is responsible in uh, the UK for our economy and therefore our money. And why Kwa Teng is interesting, despite, apart from the things that you're, you'll think are interesting, is he holds a PhD in economic history. Now remember I told you both myself and Tony are now a bit embarrassed um, because <laughs> Mr. Mr. Kwa Teng, or Dr. Kwa Teng even, holds a PhD in economic history. So like myself and Tony, um, Kwasi Kwa Teng was, he knew, about the nature of money. And many blame him for the worsening cost of living crisis. You may have heard of it. Um, and he resigned after a, a very long stint of 38 days in the job. Okay. This explains, there's one thing we're going to explain, why you don't let an economic historian uh, run the government. Okay. Um, we're, we're many things, but we shouldn't be let loose on the economy. Okay. Now, throughout the, the session today, we're running something called a, uh, going a very, a very thing, funny thing called a padlock exercise. So during this, you'll find some numbers 
on slides. I don't know if there's one on this slide, I can't see it, but there's some numbers on the slides. And if you find the numbers, um, there's a large padlock on the door, which sort of just to the side of our very kind interpreter there. And you can see the padlock. And we're going to fill those numbers in at the end um, of the lecture for a bit of fun. Um, and we've, unless we get those four numbers in the right order, we can't get out. OK, so um, I'll, I'll extend the lecture on economic history. So play, please pay close attention so we can leave uh, at the end of the lecture. Thank you. So, oops. So what is money? So on this slide, I've got various things that may or may not be money. And I want you to shout out if you think, yes, it's money, as I say what it is, or no, it's not money. And you can also tell me what you think it is. So if we start in the middle at the top, what do we think that picture is? What sort of money? What sort of money? Coins. It's, it's coins. And is coins money? Yes. Yes, everyone think yes? Yes. OK, OK, all right. Uh, I don't know if it is or not. I'm just, I agree with you. OK. Next one on this uh, there is, is, what do you think that is? Not a hieroglyph? A piece of paper. A piece of paper, yes. So it's paper money. OK, so is paper money money? Yes. OK, yeah, OK. OK, you think that's money. Right, next round, we've got, um, I think we've got seashells in the top here. Yes. Seashells. Is yes. seashells? Yes. Is that money? Yes. Not money. Yeah, not money. OK. 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 What do people think this one is? <laughs> no, not a sandwich, not a baguette. Eh? No. I'll have to tell you it's salt, OK? But it's a salt in a bar of salt. Do you think salt is money? No, 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 no. Good. Um, anybody know? Now, I had a bit of a wager with my colleagues. They said you wouldn't know this one. Does anyone know what this one is? Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. OK, so the, the colleague was wrong, just to say. Um, does anybody know, um, is Bitcoin money? OK. Everyone says yes. No no's. It's a cryptocurrency. OK, OK. And the final one, does anyone know what that is? Apple iPhone. OK. And is that money? OK. OK. All right, so what we have there are all of these things are money. OK. All right, they're all money. Uh, even the salt and the seashells are money. At some time, they've been used as money. The one thing we disagree on, myself and Tony, is the phone, which I think is money and Tony thinks isn't money. OK, so, and Tony's normally right about these things. <laughs> All right, so that's what's there. And the, the interesting thing here is that in the paper money that we identified on the, the left of me is the first ever paper money in the world. Um, does anyone know which country it comes from? China. China, China, that's right. So it's the first ever paper money in the world from about 900 AD. OK, so they're all money, and they're all money at some point in our history. They've been used as money. What my point is that money is not fixed. The form of money is not fixed. It changes and is linked to the culture of the time and their beliefs. OK, so why talk, um, so why talk about money? Uh, money is very newsworthy. And you'll have heard people talk about something called inflation, OK? So inflation. Inflation in the UK is 10%. That's what the number is. It's 10%. So my question to you is, if inflation is 10%, how much is one pound today worth in one year's time? OK, yeah, hands up. Um, one pound ten. No, that's a good, good guess. No. 90p. OK, there's a gentleman down here is correct. It's 90p. If inflation's at 10%, our money next year is worth 10% less than it's worth today. So if I can use my pound today to buy a pound's worth of sweets, next year it'll only buy 90 pence worth of sweets, that same pound. OK, now I'm worried. 
Okay, so 10%. My big question for you is, what about the year after? How much is my pound worth if 10% carries on the year after? 81p. Yeah, I said no one would get that. Yes, it's 81p. What about the year after? Okay, okay, we've got it. Okay, okay. How many years before it's worth zero? You can think about that one. You can let you, I'll let you think about that one. Okay. So money changes the value as, as, um, as, 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 we, as we go through life. And I'd like to describe money as an illusion. So you might think he's been a bit strange calling that. But money, I think, is an illusion. That can be disputed. We're told, perhaps by your parents, that money does not grow on trees. But what I'm going to tell you is actually it does grow on trees. And this is the actual the magic money tree. So this tree here is called the magic money tree. And that money creates money. The government talk about it. They talk about the magic money tree. But is the mo magic money tree real? It's a way of producing money out of thin air. So I would say there is a magic money tree. It's a controversial to take that position. But it's a secret, OK? And if we keep talking about it, we're really worried that everyone will know it's real. Um, they'll call it out, and then we'll have to disappear. So keep this secret in the room that the magic money tree exists. OK. Um, the next section comes with a warning. Don't try this at home. As I said, money is very newsworthy, and people use money to make a point. Um, does anyone know what's happening on this one here? Anyone seen that one? Shredding 10,000 pounds. OK, so Joe Lysett, a comedian, shredding 10,000 pounds. Well, did he shred 10,000 pounds? No. no, he did not. He pretended to. So a very weak point, I think. If he actually had a supply, we'd have been happier if he had done that. And he shredded this, this because he, uh, just before the World Cup, because he claimed to shred £10,000 in cash to highlight the plight of human rights in Qatar, which hosted the Men's Football World Cup. The second picture, um, as he didn't actually do that, he didn't shred £10,000. The second picture is a real picture of somebody burning £1 million. And that was in 1994 uh, in the Hebrides on a Scottish island. Uh, and that was a, that was a pop group um, called the KLF. You can go and listen to them when you get home. Uh, and they did it to make an artistic point. They thought that was an artistic point to burn one million pounds of the money they made by being musicians. Okay, so you can. It's, it, that's a very good example of uh, life imitating art, almost. Okay. So. So if all this is money. Um, what does it tell us about the form that money takes? So money can be seen as a distributed form of social credit. So to further explore this idea, uh, we'll illustrate it more later, but it's really a way of allocating and exchanging resource. And on this slide, I was going to talk about economists who believe money exists from barter, um, on, this, um, on this drawing, you can see this happening. So I may have a, um, a bakery. I produce bread. Someone else owns a load of sheep. They produce, let's say, wool. And I might be able to exchange some of that wool for the bread. And you call that barter. What happens then is as that advances, um, I haven't got a sheep, but I want some bread. Um, so the baker will then take a form of money for that bread. And he can use that money if he wants to buy wool in the future. So that's how money works as a way of helping us exchange. Um, and, the, and the way that people think money um, uh, um, uh, develops over time, it starts with barter, as I've just described, then we get coins, and then we get credit. Um, but that, I'm going to tell you that is a myth. Um, economic historians can see that the first form of money is credit. And the, the picture here shows um, uh, an image of some accounting um, chips from um, clay um, chips from Mesopotamia in 2000 BC, which is a form of credit in modern day Iraq. So the credit comes before coins and also accountancy and credit actually comes before writing. And so a fairer way of saying how money develops is credit, then barter, then coins, then electronic money and what we have today um, crypto uh, currency. Um, so a big statement is that money in itself, therefore, does not have any value. 
It is whatever we believe it as a society is worth. We accept lots of different things to represent money. And as we can see from the later examples, it doesn't even have to exist um, in reality. OK. Right. So I'm going to talk a bit about barter. So money's not free. Um, we can earn money by working or investing or being entrepreneurial by starting a business. Or we can sell trainers on eBay okay, to make money. However, if we borrow money, we do have to pay it back and we'll be charged interest. So if we clear about the sense that money changes value over time, uh, we call that the time value of money. Um, and sometimes this doesn't benefit us. Uh, we can buy things with cash, but also we can buy things with credit, but credit has interest. So it's compelling to buy something with small amounts of money over a longer time, it's going to be more expensive. So if I pay £60 today for something, or agree to pay £5 per month for 12 months, um, that's easier for me to manage in my budget, but it costs me £60. So I actually pay more for the same thing. That's fine as long as we're, we know that's what we're doing. Um, we can illustrate how value is assigned in a barter situation by looking at trading cards or football stickers. Now, I don't really understand this, um, so I'm going to ask for some help. So who's the... Uh, I don't know what it is. Well, who's the, this person here? Do we know who that is? Pikachu. Pikachu. OK, Pikachu. OK, so... If I wanted Pikachu, is he worth multiple other things? No. No? no. Yeah, he's, he's like 68. And no, no one wants him. No one wants him. Okay, so he's by the others. Okay, so he won't want him. So, and who's the other person? Jack Grealish. So, so, would you swap Pikachu for Jack Grealish? No. How many Pikachus would you want for Jack Grealish? Seven. Quite a lot. Okay, so there's value. Okay, ten. And apparently, Jack Grealish is the most um, in-demand footballer in the Panini sticker album. Why is that? OK, that's what I thought. I didn't I can't understand. It's not... OK, yeah, I, I, I get that. I don't, I, and how many, how many other stickers would you trade to get Jack? Ten. Ten. A lot. A lot, OK. Two. OK. okay. Oh! <laughs> now we're going to talk about uh, um, medieval cashless society. So the concept of paying things about cash was the same in medieval as uh, Europe, and sometimes they have even more sophisticated methods of moving money because of their particular local circumstances. So the question today, we're going to need our role play, our first role play down, please. So the question today is, does anybody know what we call our cash in uh, the UK today? So we have one here and one here. OK, does anyone know what we call our cash today in the UK? Pounds. Pounds. Does anyone know why we call a pound a pound? Yes, yes. Because, of, because a pound is a pound how much it weighs. It weighs, that's right. OK, so in medieval Europe, OK, or in England anyway, um, a pound... Um, is 240 silver pennies. And that's how much. I've had 240 silver pennies that weighs a pound. This little bag of sugar, that's, that's a pound. I thought it'd be much heavier. I'm a bit disappointed. But anyway, that's 500 grams. But in, in uh, old terms, imperial measures, it's a pound. And that would be 240 silver coins. I want you to suspend your disbelief. And in my hand, I'm holding 240 silver coins. OK, so I'm going to give you one pound. That's, is it heavy? No, OK, that's bad news. I thought it would be heavy. Right. So you owe your friend a pound. So off you go. I owe you a pound, all right? Is that heavy? Kind of. Right, now you owe them two pounds. Is that heavy? <laughs> now you owe you three pounds. Is that heavy? <coughs> yeah? Well, I owe you ten pounds. Oh, it's okay, it's okay, I don't have any more sugar, so thank you very much, okay. Thank you. Oh, that was heavy. Okay. We're going to have a bit of um, a demo in a minute, but what I would like to show there is that if you owe them one pound, you have to give 240 silver pennies. A pound does not exist. 
I actually have to give them 240 silver pennies. Um, and then you, you'd weigh it to check. How do I know? I don't want to count 240 pennies, I'm too lazy. So I weigh that to check. It's, 200, it's one pound. Um, so the learning here is that moving money in medieval Europe is not practical if you're using coins, because it's too heavy. It's too heavy to move money, but also from this picture I'm going to show you, it's too dangerous. So this is an image. Um, it's not a photograph. Does anybody know that? Why it's not a photograph? Well, no, apart from that. Yeah, no, that's correct. Cameras are not invented yet. That was a trick question. I'm sorry. Okay, so it's not a photograph. So in, what this shows, though, is, is that barrels. I don't know if you can see right at the back. There's barrels in a in a in a cart, and inside the barrels, do you know a barrels? What you have, a big barrel, big wooden barrel, is full of silver coins. That's how you transport money, remember, because you need so much silver coins. So I pack them into barrels. I put them on 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 the uh, on the on the wagon and I transport them. And then I need all these other people. Do anyone know who the people are around the barrels? Soldiers. soldiers. Why do I need the soldiers? <laughs> yes, because this, cause this, this actual, this actual um, is happening in Sherwood Forest, and just here is Robin Hood. OK, have you heard of Robin Hood? Yeah. yeah, and he's waiting to take the silver. So not only is it, da is it heavy, it's also dangerous. And I have to pay all of these soldiers Every day, they're protecting my money. So even without Robin Hood sneaking around, the cost of money, moving money, is too expensive. So it's not just too heavy, it's too expensive, uh, and it's very difficult. So anyway, now we're going to have a look at a real coin, and hopefully up to uh, um, in more detail. Here we go. Now, some of you will have seen this outside. Um, this is a, um, a, a coin called a noble, a gold coin called a noble from 1360s, sometime between 1360 and 1369 when Edward III was King of England. Here he is on the coin. Can you see Edward III on the coin? He seems to be holding, what do you see what he's holding in his hands? A sword and a shield, that's right. Um, and that tradition of being on a coin um, has lasted um, to today. Does anyone recognise these people? Yeah. Who's this person? And who's this? Charles III. Charles III. Who are they? King and Queen. Okay, so that lasts today. So having a picture or an image of the King or Queen on your on your coins is a very important sign of royal power and authority then and now, and criminals are punished for counterfeiting. And this was extreme punishments in the Middle Ages. Now, did anyone realise that I told you all a lie? I said we didn't have any gold, and yet I'm showing you a golden coin, aren't I? So at some point, gold becomes more important at silver. So you have to be questioning and realise that everything Adrian's telling you isn't correct sometimes. OK, that's what being a researcher is. So the gold noble is worth 80 pence. So that's about one third of a pound. So now you only need three gold nobles to pay someone a pound. I no longer need a bag of sugar every time I want to give someone a pound. I can give them three gold nobles, much lighter than the bags of sugar. And indeed, Edward III got the weight ratio to silver wrong to begin with, and it was worth more as gold than it was as a coin. So what did everyone do? Everyone melted them down to replace them with silver. Um, and he had to take them all back and start again. Now, the gold noble was introduced in 1344, and its design is Edward III standing in a ship referring to the English... That's him. Yep. It's referring to the English victory at Sluis in 1340. And this particular coin, and this coin was struck. So it'd be have, we'd have a die, and we'd have, a, we'd have the, the uh, gold, on, uh, gold sheet, and we'd use a big hammer, and we'd strike that image into the coin, and then cut it out with shears. And then we'd have to turn it around and do the reverse image. We'll look at the reverse image in a second. Um, and this is um, 
as we know, it's between 1360 and 1369 because of the wording where he's called, if you look around the side, he's Edward, King of England, or Rex of Anglia, and he's Lord of Hibernium. Does anyone know who Hibernian is? Scotland. Not Scotland. Wales. Not Wales. Ireland. Ireland. And Duke of Aquitaine. Okay, and Aquitaine's a part of France. Before this, he was King of France, but he decided to change his name on this coin, and he had to change it back again in 1369 when he decided he was King of France again. It's very expensive changing his titles. Now, on the reverse, if you can look at the reverse side, so on the reverse side here is a quotation from the Bible in Latin. I won't tell you the Latin, but it says, but Jesus, passing through the midst of them, went on his way, which is apparently believed to endow the coin with all amulet properties as a protection against thieves. So most of the gold for these coins came from the wool trade and a mint was established in Calais in 1363 to convert gold and silver, uh, mostly gold from trading port system uh, known as a staple. Okay, thank you very much Claire for that. That was a lovely coin, thank you. So now we come to the, uh, the big event of uh, what we're going to do. They try, we're going to try and do a role play um, to work out how do we move money um, across Europe um, without using money. Um, and we're going to do this um, using a, a bill of exchange. So can all of the uh, volunteers come down and take their places? So we've got hats and all sorts. Bruges here, one of you hold that. There we go. We've got our bill of exchange, and over here we have Venice. So we need our two Venice people over there and our two Bruges people here. One of you wear who wants this who wants this hat? There's two hats, so you gotta have that hat. Okay. Okay, uh, well, I hope everyone can hear me. Perfect. Uh, so we're going to try and do a speed run of financial history, uh, of showing you how financial uh, instruments were developed uh, by people addressing practical problems that they came across. Uh, and what we will kind of see by the end uh, is the, a lot of the technology, the instruments, the ideas that medieval merchants and bankers and traders came up with are in fact still at the heart of the banking system today. Uh, so although I said this is a series of, of simple steps, uh, they add up to something quite complicated. This is just my covering myself in case something goes wrong. Uh, but as, we, as those of you who've been watching the news will know, very often things do go wrong in finance, and sometimes $8 billion can just be misplaced. Uh, hopefully we won't do that here, because we're just using chocolate coins instead of, uh, instead of real money. Uh, okay, so we're going to start off with the situation of two merchants, uh, one in Bruges, uh, one end of Europe, uh, the other in Venice, so 800 miles, the Alps between them. And our first merchant, uh, our first Santa uh, wants to send some money to their partner, their colleague in uh, Venice. So they want to send some money from Bruges uh, to Venice. Now, the first thing they could do is just use a messenger. 
What could be simpler? So they have the coins in Bruges. Uh, if you give them to the messenger, so they hand the coins to the messenger. Of course, uh, if this was uh, a large transaction, there may be may have been heavy, may have been carts of gold and silver that need to be transported 800 miles across the Alps, uh, or could be shipped by sea uh, from Venice all the way over to Bruges. So the messenger, if you want to go, go. Over, the, over the Alps, be careful, don't, don't fall off. Uh, and if you give, yes, there we go, and just give the coins to, uh, your, to Santa's partner in, in Venice. Nice and easy. What could, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, so if we try again, do we need the money back? Uh, no, they, they can keep the money. <laughs> I think we, we've got enough money. We can just print some more, <laughs> print some more money. Uh, so this time, uh, that worked so well. Uh, now we will send... So if you want to... Uh, now we will send you over with three bags of gold coins. So that's two, that's three. So you're going over oh, the on. Alps. But, back, but back. hold on. So hold you're on. walking along the Alps. But someone has noticed. People have noticed that there is a cart of gold and silver slowly crossing over the Alps. So what might happen? Yeah. The bandits or the bandits on the Alps, or if you ship it by sea, there might be pirates waiting. Uh, and what are the pirates going to do? You're going to attack, but not actually attack. Uh, but you're going to go, go on, take the and money. you're going to take the coins. So if you go, oh, stop it, stop, there we are. So unfortunately, so yes, don't put up a fight. So if you just give, uh, as, as you always talk, yeah, you are, if, you're, if you're ever accosted by someone and they ask you for some money or your mobile phone or something, just, you know, don't, don't fight. Uh, come back, mobile, come back. Anyway, yeah. come back. So there we go. All right. So we've had Reset. the issue. The problem is it's expensive and heavy to transport all these coins, this physical gold and silver, across Europe to make payments. Uh, it's also dangerous because it's tempting for the bandits or the pirates uh, to seize this gold or silver. Uh, so what we want to do is come up with a way of transferring value, transferring the idea of money as a concept, between two places, but without actually sending any coins. So it's like a magic trick. Uh, how can we do this? So the tool they developed uh, was the Bill of Exchange. Uh, and this required not just for two parties, this required four parties. So it's a bit more complicated in that sense. Uh, we're introducing financial intermediaries here. So now instead of just the Santa, the merchant at Bruges and Venice, we introduce effectively a banker, uh, bankers at Bruges and Venice who are going to manage this transfer of money. So now we have uh, our merchant, our Santa, and they have a partner now, or they have a contact uh, in Venice who has also a contact, another elf, another banker elf to help them, uh, in, in Venice. So what we can do here, have you got your uh, money? Got the money. So now, uh, instead of transferring the coins from one place to another, uh, so the Santa would give the coins to the banker in Bruges. So to the, well, I've got about the wrong way around, it should be Santa giving them Yeah, Santa's the best, got to give. Yeah. Banker. Sorry. There you are. You knew and we'd get it wrong. I knew you'd get it wrong, yeah. And you get, and you and receive yeah, this. I'll exchange, take that. Yeah. In exchange for the so coins... you bought that. Uh, so the coins stay in, stay in Bruges. Uh, instead, you now have a bill of exchange, which is addressed to the banker, the elf partner in Venice, instructing them to make a payment uh, to the named, uh, to Santa's partner in, in Venice. So now we give the bill of exchange to the messenger. No, Sorry, not, not the, the money. Coins. No money. We we'll no keep money. the money. You keep, you keep that money. So the bill of exchange goes to the messenger. Yeah, messenger comes over to give we need it some to money there. Go over the Alps. Stop a second. Now the, the bandits come along. But what good is this? It's a bit of paper. There's no gold. There's no silver. What are the bandits going to do with a bit of paper? They can't cash it in because only it can only be paid to the named recipient. Uh, so there's no value to them. So you're safe from the bandits because once they know that you're paying uh, with a bill of exchange rather than gold or silver, there's no point in them ambushing you. Uh, so unfortunately, you've already got your coins. There's, there's no more coins at the moment for you guys. It's putting the bandits out of a job, but that's, that's progress, I guess. Uh, so now continue on to Venice. If you hand it, sorry, to the elf, uh, if you hand the bill of exchange to the elf, 
Oh, sorry, no, wrong way around. <laughs> Here we go. Hand it to Santa. Oh, you go again. Uh, Elf should have a point. Yeah. Hand it to Santa. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now uh, Santa has the bill of exchange, which she presents to the elf uh, in exchange for the gold coins. So swap those two around. And there we have, we've now, uh, the Santa in Bruges has, in Venice, has the, has the gold coins. Uh, so the value has been transferred uh, from Santa in Bruges to Santa in Venice without physically transporting any coins between the two towns. And how has this been done? So what is the trick? Yeah, so so that's the mechanics, but how has the the Santa in Venice been able to get the gold coins? Right here. While the, yeah, well the original gold coins are still stayed in in Bruges. Yeah, so what have we actually done? We've not moved gold coins from A to B. We've... Yeah. Sort of credit, yeah. What we've basically done is we've reallocated coins that were already at A and B. Uh, so the coins haven't moved, but the existing coins have moved between different people at places A and B. Uh, so... Uh, and what we find happens in the next stage of financial evolution is we don't even need to move the coins. Uh, because nowadays, how do, uh, <laughs> you, you kids may not know this yet, but how do we pay? How do we make the majority of payments? Um, cards. cards. Yeah, and um, how does it work? When I pay for something with my bank card, what happens? If, if they send a message to your bank, and then mm -hmm. like, deducts money from your account. Yeah, and adds it to someone else's account. So instead of sw swapping coins backwards and forwards, effectively, we're sending messages to credit or debit people's bank accounts, people's accounts of a bank. And you can see, effectively, this is uh, the next stage. We don't even need to move the coins from Bruges uh, at Bruges or Venice. We simply credit or debit uh, the relative, uh, respective accounts there. Uh, so, and this again gets back to the point that Adrian was saying, which is that money is not ultimately something physical. It's about information, uh, and it's about allocation of resources and reallocation of resources. And it's also uh, why the job of being a banker, being a financial intermediary, is A, so important, uh, but also quite lucrative, because obviously every time you make one of these payments or these transfers, uh, the financial institutions will be receiving a small payment uh, for their work. So uh, that effectively is the system that they developed in the Middle Ages uh, to avoid having to transfer coins backwards and forwards. They drew on a network of bankers across Europe, crediting people's accounts, uh, so trusted networks of people sharing information about who was to be credited or who was to be debited money. And uh, to a large extent, that is still the system that we have today. When you're making uh, international transfers, your bank will be writing to their correspondent bank in another country, asking them to make a deposit or a transfer to the named account. Uh, and indeed, much of the terminology is the same as they were using uh, back in the Middle Ages. So again, this is where financial history has some value. We can understand how the current system evolved to deal with problems in the past. Uh, and how it is still the foundation for what we do today, even though we don't have bandits and we don't need to cross the Alps anymore, uh, but we have modern communications technology. Uh, so okay, thank to you, Tony. So uh, thank you, everyone. You're going to go and get some treats. You keep those here. You can keep that. Go, to see that. go and see Emma. Go and see Emma. And you get a treat down the end there. You keep those. You keep the coins. Go and see Emma. You can keep the coins. Thank you. Keep them. We've got coins. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, a round of applause once again. Well done.
Okay, is anyone still confused? Uh, I was, but uh, that's just me. Okay, so, so hopefully, um, I know. I hope. I hope we've had some fun today. Um, but I was told by um, the pro vice chancellors who were sat at the front that we had to actually have learned something today. But don't worry, there's no tests. So what have we learned today? We've learned that money is just a concept, and it works as long as we believe in it. And that's a bit like Tinkerbell from Peter Pan, you may have come across. If we believe in Tinkerbell, then she will exist. And it then holds credibility. Problems arise when this credibility or trust in this system is lost. So as an example, remember our reference to the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kwasi Kwarteng. Many commentators argue that his mini-budget blew away the financial markets and destroyed the UK's financial credibility. And he himself, just last weekend, admitted he got carried away, he was too impatient, there was a brief moment, and the people in charge, myself included, not me, him, blew it. Um, now, for political impartiality, we should also acknowledge the current Chancellor, um, does anybody know who that is? Jeremy. Jeremy Hunt. Now, luckily, I can, I can reassure you, he does not have a PhD in economic history. Um, but he does, uh, and he quickly acted to calm the markets by simply reversing almost everything that Kwartang had proposed. So what else have we learned? So don't accept people telling you that things are new and have never happened before. As we've explored today, especially with Tony and all our brilliant volunteers, when things are, we can find historical parallels when things have happened before, and normally uh, they're even more better than the new thing we're being told about. And that is the end of the lecture today. Thank you very much for coming. Here we go. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I, I thought Adrian would talk about Scrooge when he was talking about money today in the pre-Christmas lecture, uh, but instead he spoke about a magic money tree instead, which I think we all, we all prefer to Scrooge. Adrian didn't tell one of my favourite stories about money we talked about earlier. That is that the seashells you saw at the beginning are actually sunk off the sea in a Pacific island. The islanders use the idea of the seashells and the promise of the seashells as money rather than exchanging the seashells. So that idea yeah. of money as a concept is much older and goes far beyond, um, far beyond Europe. So um, I think where does it even, I'm not sure what we've learned today. We've learned lots of things today. Um, and we certainly learned that while um, we don't want economic historians to run the country, we're very happy for them to give Christmas lectures. So. Before I, uh, I, I close today and uh, would like to uh, and wish you all a very, very happy Christmas and a restful, a restful few days before the new year starts again, please join me all in thanking both Adrian and Tony for a wonderful way to end this term and to end this <laughs> So okay. we, we can't get out yet because, of yeah, course, the door is still locked. So yeah, I'll hand over back to Adrian, yeah, don't forget, who, we can, can't who, leave. who yeah. can help us to unlock the yeah. doors. OK, thank you, Dominic. So um, there were two competitions. The, uh, does anyone play the coins in the jar game? Yeah, OK, so the winner is Alma. Does Alma know who she is? Right, you won. You guessed how many? Yeah, and there was 171, so you absolutely magic that. Spot on. Well done, Alma. Okay. And see Emma, yeah? See Emma. Don't, let, don't go without seeing Emma, okay? Because she's got the prize, okay, for that. Now, numbers. The code cracking. Remember, we can't leave unless we get these numbers. Did anyone notice the numbers? Oh, ah! One at a time. One at a time. First number. What's the first number at the back? Somebody at the back? What's the first number? Two. They're shouting. They want to go. Two. Next number. Zero. Zero. Next number. Two. 
Last number. Yeah. Did that work? Should we check? Should we say? Yay! Well done. <laughs> well done. And if you leave, you'll get something nice when you leave as well by the door. Okay, so thank you very much.